All right. <clears throat> Bismillah ar rahim Thank you guys all for coming. Really appreciate it. Um, um, let's just get straight into it. So, why is this topic important? Like, why are we talking about this and not something else? Today, we're going to be talking about something known as nihilism. So, why is this topic really worth talking about? Because we could all be outside talking with our friends, discussing random stuff. Why are we here discussing this specifically? The reason why we're discussing nihilism, and I'll explain what that is later, is because we, we have a society today which is promoting a worldview known as New Atheism. And you find a lot of people who grow up in religious families end up becoming non-religious later on in their lives. And that's not an accident. That's the way our society is priming us to be. And so the reason why this knowledge is important is because what we're going to be doing today is showing people what atheism leads to. Because I feel like a lot of people don't really understand the implications of their atheism. So if we show them the trajectory of where it leads to, hopefully this will inform them and give them a better idea of, okay, is this something I want to pursue? Is this the right path for me? And hopefully it will let them, it will make them reconsider their beliefs. So what we're going to be discussing today, it's not a pancake recipe. It's not something arbitrary. This has real life implications. Like you guys are going to use this for sure, guaranteed later on in your life. You're going to think back and you're going to reflect on your life and you're going to think back to this day and Wednesday because we're going to have like a part one, part two. And this knowledge is going to be something which you guys will use later on in your life. So I'm very glad that you guys are here and that we can be discussing this. So when... There's a lot of people, I don't want to name any names, but we could use one example, let's say his name is John, okay? So let's say John, you know, he grew up in a religious household, he went to a secular school, and eventually he became an atheist. And usually, um, they make it seem like, you know, like a really happy thing, like, you know, you become an atheist, everything's cool, everything's fun. Um, and John begins living his life in a hedonistic way. Hedonist, do you guys know what a hedonistic way is? What, is, what does it mean when someone lives like care about material things? Material yeah, life. exactly. So hedonism or living your life in a hedonistic way is basically just doing what makes you feel good. So kind of like dopamine farming, like whatever makes you feel good, you just do it. Um, and if you guys want to get into like the philosophy thing, there's something called utilitarianism where basically Jeremy Bentham writes that you have two lords. You have the Lord of pleasure and you have the Lord of pain. You want to maximize your pleasure and minimize your pain. So when you live your life in a hedonistic way, you're basically just following your desires. Whatever your heart desires, you just do it. You kind of live kind of like, uh, like, a, like bestial, kind of. So John, he begins living his life in a hedonistic way. Let's expand the circle a little bit, let these guys come in. So just move back, you guys can pull up a chair, come on in. Thank you guys for coming. Um, and so John, he begins living his life, you know, doing what he wants. He goes to nightclubs, he goes drinking, he goes partying. And he tries everything. He tries every single thing. But at the end of the day, he thinks, you know, this can't just be it. You know, because everything he does, it doesn't really have like a meaning. It doesn't, and you guys can grab some snack. It doesn't have like purpose behind it. And so he stops and he thinks, this can't be all there is to life just doing these things. There has to be more. And so John looks into things like religion. So he looks like he looks at Buddhism, he looks at Hinduism, these different types. And finally, he he looks at Islam and he ends up becoming a Muslim. And this is a true story. I'm not making this up. And the reason why is because he found himself in something known as nihilism. So we're going to be discussing what nihilism is today and why atheism leads to nihilism, okay? Because nihilism is the actual implication of atheism, and it's not something people usually think about. So it's something I'm going to be bringing uh, to your attention today. So today and on Wednesday, we're going to be discussing three things. Number one, what is nihilism? Number two, why does atheism lead to nihilism? And number three, how can we overcome it, or defeat it, or work around it? So let's start with the first one, what is nihilism? Who here has heard of that before? Anyone heard of nihilism before? Okay. Um, what do you guys think of it? Like, well, what is nihilism? I mean, yeah. Isn't it just the general belief that nothing matters? Yeah, okay, that's good. Anyone want to add on? Absence of purpose or direction, just like mindlessly doing whatever you want. 
Okay, good. So basically nihilism, you guys put it really well. It's the belief that there's no meaning, there's no value, there's no purpose, and there's no hope. So let me say that again. There's no meaning, there's no value, there's no purpose, and there's no hope. It's a very, very dark place to be. And I don't think it's a place that any of us want to be in. And I don't want you guys to be in a place like that. Now, when it comes to nihilism, there's a very important figure known as Friedrich Nietzsche. Anyone heard of Friedrich Nietzsche before? Friedrich Nietzsche, he lived in a time where Christianity was dying as a religion and atheism and science were kind of taking over. And he was going through a lot of pain because of this. He is regarded by some as a prophet, but not a prophet in the conventional sense, like Muhammad or Noah or Jesus like that. They call him a prophet because he made predictions about the future, very bold, very specific predictions which came true. So for example, he predicted that Europe is going to go through an existential crisis. Because he saw everyone becoming non-religious, and he saw where this would lead them. Most people don't see it, but he saw it. And the way that he kind of illustrated this was in the famous story of the madman. Anyone here heard of the parable of the madman? Okay, I'll tell you the story. It's, it's a very famous story, and it really goes to show like what the implications of atheism are. So basically, this is the story. And every time I hear this, it gives me chills. And you guys will understand why. So the story goes, there's a guy, he runs into the market, and he runs into the market and he's carrying a lantern, okay? So you could say like Costco, think about Costco, right? He runs in, he's carrying a lantern, and he starts yelling, God is dead. So he starts yelling, God is dead. God is dead, God remains dead, and we have killed him, basically saying that Science and everything is making us away, like going away from him. He says, how shall we comfort ourselves, the murderers of all murderers? Because we have killed God. So he goes around and starts telling people, guys, we've killed God. What are we going to do? What are we going to do? And everyone's just looking at him like, you know, what's wrong with this guy? And what the guy does is that he throws down his lantern and he says, I have come too early. So what do you guys think the story is talking about? The story of the madman. He goes in, yeah. When he said, I come too early, that's our, that, that means that something's going to happen in the future. I like that. Okay. Anybody want to add on to that? Like, what do you think? Well, what's the purpose of this story? And why does it relate to what we're talking about? When, when he says, I have come too early. I like, I like what he said. He said, meaning he came too early, meaning something's going to happen. So, basically, the point of this story is that what it does is that the man, the madman with the lantern, he understands the implications of living in a godless world. And the people around him don't really understand that yet. That's why he said, I have come too early. Because these people don't understand the trajectory of where this is leading. So he predicted that Europe would, yeah. Uh, did you say what, when like, the story was, was taking place? Uh, no, well, so this is, it didn't actually happen. He just okay. made up a story, like, mm -hmm. kind of like a metaphor, just to illustrate his point. Okay. Yeah. So the whole point of the story that he told was to basically show that, because during his time, people were moving away from religion. And so he saw that and it caused him a lot of pain because he saw where that would lead, but other people didn't see it. So he predicted that Europe would go through an existential crisis and... And it did, the Western world did that. And even today you'll find atheists talking about the importance of being spiritual, the importance of meditation and these types of things. Because even they know that the human being needs like some sort of religious purpose or value in order to live our life. We need a purpose, we need meaning. Everyone here searches for meaning. We can't live our life just simply thinking nothing matters, right? So there's a guy named Arthur Schopenhauer. He gave a reason for why we look for meaning. Because you guys could ask, why do we need meaning in our lives, right? He basically gave us a formula. It was two things added together, and this is what causes us to look for meaning. So he said, the two things, two factors. The suffering in this life, coupled with the inevitable death that we will all experience. These two things, suffering plus death, 
it equals a search for meaning. Because we need to search for a reason to, for our existence, to make our life bearable. Or else, why, why, why do we do this? Because let's be honest here, life is not easy. Like, life is full of challenges and hurdles and obstacles. I mean, we're at, we're at UPA. Like, we all know this, right? It's not easy. I mean, it could be worse, but it could be better too. So, we need to see, we need to believe that there's light at the end of the tunnel. We need to know that at the end of it all, there is something to look forward to. That there is a reason for our existence, that we're not just here to just survive. And so, Nietzsche, he was living in a time where Christianity was dying. And Christianity was something that gave people hope because you believe in a hereafter, you believe in a day of judgment, you believe in an afterlife. But that was now going away. So now he was getting scared. He was like, where are we going to get the meaning from? Where do we find the comfort now? The thing is, if you look at the implications of a hardcore materialistic point of view or a worldview, they're actually very scary. Because think about this. And this is, and maybe once I tell you this, you guys will realize like why Nietzsche was going through so much pain. If I take a knife and I stab this table, okay? Then I take the same knife and I stab Hudayfa. Is there a difference between the two? Well, what's the difference? You heard him. I heard him? Yeah. Okay, fine. I heard him. Anything else? Any other difference? Yeah. Um, the table is conscious. They're not conscious and I'm conscious. Okay, so the, the table is not conscious and he's conscious. Okay, cool. So the table won't feel pain, but I will. Okay, so the feeling of pain. So he's saying that... Um, there's going to be like a reaction or like a painful feeling for him, but not for the table. Okay. On a hardcore materialistic point of view, and we went over how materialists, they don't believe that consciousness is separate. They believe it's basically the brain. On a hardcore materialistic point of view, there's actually no difference between him and the table. Because bottom down, they're both just atoms. There's no soul. There's no, there's no uh, divine connection or any sort of um, thing inside of him is he's just made up of molecules and atoms just like the table So all I'm doing is rearranging molecules now If that doesn't scare you If that doesn't diminish you if that doesn't devalue the human experience then nothing else will Because the fact that Me hurting the table and me hurting him are the same We know internally that's not true like obviously there is a value for a human over something like a rock yeah. over like the brown stuff you find in the toilet okay but on, mat on materialism it's the same thing there's actually no difference but the thing is right I mean we say like oh but we live in the modern world right like you know we have technology here all those philosophers back in the day like we don't really care about them I mean they were just you know writing whatever, whatever they're writing they're thinking about some random stuff like that doesn't apply to us, right? Like, we live in the modern world, we have technology, we have science here, we're chilling. We don't really need them. Or do we? The thing is, a lot of atheists haven't really thought about nihilism. And that's, that's the sad truth. Because we have atheists at this school, right? They're not going around like they're depressed. They're, they're perfectly fine. But the reason why they're fine is because they haven't actually thought about what their atheism implies. Because on atheism, there is no afterlife. There is no light at the end of the tunnel. You have suffering and you have death and you have nothing, nothing to kind of give it meaning. And we love meaning. We, humans search for meaning because we need something to make this life bearable. We need something to look forward to. We need to know why we exist. So there's a guy called Philip H. Phoenix. He gave four reasons why nihilism will be present in modern day society. Because we say, you know, we're modern. We don't need that. We don't need those philosophers anymore, you know. Well, you know, we have science, we have technology. Like, we're fine. But he gave four reasons why nihilism will be present today. The first reason, and I'll read them out and then I'll explain them. Or I'll ask if you guys can understand them. So, the first one is, the spirit of criticism and skepticism which dominate the domains of science and philosophy um, among many other fields. So, the spirit of criticism and skepticism. What do you guys think this is talking about? Yeah. The ability to improve from the judgment of others. Okay. Yeah. 
Um, more of like just like the you know the Reddit scientists which just like criticize everything they see. It's like you don't have evidence for that in like okay. a really high pitched voice. Okay. Yeah, I basically them. Okay, interesting. Uh, the pessimistic side of your brain that oh. wants to downgrade everything. Okay. Anything else? Okay, I really like what we had there. So when when he speaks about criticism and skepticism, right? The thing is, throughout history, especially around um, like the scientific revolution, when we started figuring stuff out, when we started figuring figuring out like the Earth was not flat, when we started making advancements in science, our whole world was turned upside down, and people started questioning everything. They started questioning scientific truths, and then they started questioning things like religion, and then now they're questioning gender, and they're just questioning everything. Just don't, like, just question and criticize everything. This is, like, something which is hyped nowadays. Like, and the thing is, like, nothing is sacred, nothing is set in stone, everything can change. Like, this, this is kind of the spirit that we have. Now, this is something which is valuable when it comes to science, because that is what science is at the end of the day. It's always changing, it's always evolving, right? But this kind of criticism, skepticism, it leads to something where you're never really sure about anything. Like anything can change and it doesn't really give you like that security. Okay, the second thing he said, and this is a really wordy thing. So I'm gonna read it very slowly and I'll see if you guys understand, right? So the second reason why nihilism is present today is because the tendency towards depersonalization and the fragmenting of complex societies due to industrialization and alienation. That was a mouthful. I'm going to say it one more time. The tendency towards depersonalization and the fragmenting of complex societies due to industrialization and alienation. So what do you guys think that is? It's kind of like how um, you're less integrated into your family or your community. You're integrated into work. You're just integrated into your purpose. It just like serves some other individual rather than like serving your community, serving who you believe you are, serving your religion, whatever. Okay, so individualism versus um, like complementarianism, okay, I like that. Uh, I think uh, in addition to what he said, kind of the idea of instead of in a social sense, rather than like before, before phones, we would go out and we'd talk to people face to face. Now it's very easy to just text someone and have a whole conversation there. I like that. Okay, so the advancement of technology kind of creates barriers between people. I like that. Okay. Anything you else? Could, you could also add it on to like uh, the, what's it called? The, uh, what's the word for like surface level? Like, I don't know the word for it. I forgot it. I think I see kind of what you're saying. Yeah, but like that, like all interactions and relationships are surface level. Everything is superficial. Superficial. Okay, I like that. Sword. Okay, yeah, I like that. So kind of like fake, like people or something. Mm -hmm. Yeah, fake everything. Okay, I want you guys to imagine a village, kind of like a village life. Okay, if you were living in a village, people who live in a village like they know their second, third, fourth, fifth cousins, right? They're all connected. The women of the household probably meet 10, 15 other women every day. They chat. Um, the funerals, there's a large gathering at funerals. Like there's a huge sense of community, right? In kind of like a village life. As you move away from that and you go into the city and you go and things start getting urbanized, people don't really have that sense of connection anymore with their family, their extended family. And technology obviously, as Rohan brought up, does play a role in that as well. And this is especially apparent if you look at London. When you think of London, you think, you know, it's a big city, busy, you know, very lively. One of the biggest problems in London is that people are lonely. Like people don't talk to their neighbors. People don't really socialize that much. And you would think it's such a big city, there's so many people, but loneliness is an actual, it's an actual reality there. So when he taught, when this whole reason basically is, when you move away from the kind of village life and you start um, industrializing and you have people living super close together, um, what it does is it creates separation. It creates depersonalization. Like you don't have those connections that you would otherwise have. Okay, third reason for, yeah. No, I have a question. So yeah. regarding uh, this industrialization, creating loneliness, specifically in London, mm -hmm. I've heard of the idea, idea that it's, you're giving up this idea of um, the community for better living. It's easier living. Back then people died from like, diseases we have vaccines for today yeah many and now life is 
easier. So when, when you say when you say better living, what do you mean by better? Better in the sense of more comfort. I guess hedonistic living. In a okay, sense. yeah. So like, like, like I sit on a couch. Instead I think of materialistic more. is a better word. Like based off right. of because that's how we kind of say that you know we're like America is better. You know, look at all our money. Look at our military. Look at but our then it economy. can also be in terms of knowledge. Like, Chromebook has access to all the information you could ever need. That's the third reason. Okay, okay that's a good segue. The third reason is overabundance of both things and information inevitably overwhelming the modern citizen. So I'm very glad you brought that up. The thing is, humans are very strange creatures because a lot of the times we want something which is actually not good for us. So for example, if you go, if you're hungry, right? Like sometimes you wish like, man, I wish I had a huge buffet right here. I want every single type of food. That overabundance of choice, like all those options, actually ends up making us unhappy and i have personal experience with this like when i was on a plane if the movie selection is too big you can't decide you're like should, should i watch this i want to watch that i want to watch this i don't have enough time what do i do like this overabundance of and also information like he was saying like the internet we have so much stuff like if you think about it we went from movies to youtube videos to tiktoks like the the attention span is just getting shorter and shorter and shorter until anything longer than seven seconds it's not worth it because we have so much information at our fingertips with the internet and everything that it actually overwhelms us even though we don't realize it and finally the fourth reason is rapid rates of change which leave a constant feeling of impermanence and a lack of security what do you guys think when it says rapid rates of change which leads to insecurity what kind of change are we talking about here yeah Technology, Technology, I like that. Okay. Societal. Societal, so like progress, moral progress, these types of things. Okay. Okay. I really like that. So I want you guys to think about your grandpa. Think about your grandfather. Okay. So l let's see let's say this is you. This is your grandfather. I want you to think about his grandfather. The difference between the two worlds wasn't really that much. And then if you think about his grandfather, Again, the world that they were preparing their children for was almost the same. If you go 1850, 1750, 1650, 1550, like these kind of centuries, there wasn't much real change. Like the world that they were pre preparing their kids for was not really much different than the one that they had. But today, if you go back 30 years, the world is a completely different place. You don't have Apple, you don't have AI, you don't have any of these things. So over the past 20 to 30 years, the world has changed so, so much. And because of that, it leaves us with a sense of insecurity. Like everything is changing. The norms are changing. The technology is changing. Our way of life is changing. So what this does is it gives us a lack of security because we don't really know what's going to happen. The way that I, I don't know what world my kids are going to inherit. The same way my parents didn't know what world I was going to inherit. So anyway, these kind of four reasons was why he says nihilism will be present in modern day society. And today you're, you will find people who seemingly have everything. They have money, they have fame, they have resources, they have people, they have everything that they have, everything that they tell you, that you know, the capitalist dream, the American dream, all the money you want, all the relationships you want, all, all of this, all of that. But you will find these people aren't actually happy inside. Like you guys can look at people who won the lottery. A lot of the times, like, they're not happy. Maybe at first, but not really. And then you have people like Robin Williams, who, do you guys know Robin Williams, he's a comedian. On the outside, he's making the world laugh, but on the inside, he was really crying. And he ended up committing suicide. So society tells us that the American dream will make us happy. Like, you know, go be successful, go get a job, go get money, get this, get that. But the same people who they say are successful, those people are depressed. Those people don't know why they're living and they don't want to live anymore. So that really makes you wonder, what actually makes someone happy? Because on atheism, on a materialistic point of view, on a worldview, life is meaningless. All of this is meaningless. None of it really matters. There's no morality, there's no value, there's no purpose, there's no meaning, there's nothing. None of it really matters. And that leads to nihilism, which is obviously 
a place nobody wants to be. Uh, let's go with him and then. Yeah. Um, so in my religion, it's that the only purpose of life is to meet God. So mm-hmm. That's the only purpose. Like everything else is fake. I like that. Like, yeah. So it was just like one quote. Um, can't say it into English. It was like, life is falsehood and death is true. I like that. Yeah, we believe in something very, very similar. Um, yeah, but the thing is, we're not really talking about purpose of life right now. That's Wednesday. So you're a little bit ahead, but you can see where I'm going with this. Today we're f- focusing only on nihilism and why atheism leads to nihilism. Because people don't really know that. Because when, when people say like, when people think of religion, they think, oh, it's like some old thing, you know, it's outdated. You know, this is 2022. Like, we don't need that anymore. But you have to show them the actual implication, where that leads to. And that's when they start realizing, okay, you know what? This might not be something. This, not, this might not be a road I want to go down. But yeah, thank you for bringing that up. We're going we're gonna to explore that on Wednesday. Yeah. What about people like the exploiter billionaires, like what Musk gates, all the people who appear happy because what they keep on, because their purpose in life is to just get accrue more wealth and with whatever means they can. Yeah, so I notice a lot of you guys, and I'm really glad about this, a lot of you guys are jumping to the purpose of life. So far today, I don't think I've said anything about the purpose of life. All I've said, all we've talked about is nihilism. But the fact that you guys are going from nihilism to the purpose of life makes me really happy because that is how you overcome nihilism. You need to find a purpose which is actually meaningful, which is actually true, and that's how you overcome it. So I like this problem-solving UPA mentality that you guys have. It's actually very nice. Um... But that's something that we'll get to on Wednesday, yeah. How do you view the difference between like being an atheist and basically being a nihilist versus agnostic? Because agnostic is kind of like, don't you think it's kind of cheating in a sense? Claiming one thing but then really believing the same thing as atheists? Kind of? So agnostics, right, they can't really say anything. Because uh, if when you say something, right, that statement usually associates with one type of view or another. So agnosticism, you're just sitting there you're listening to both sides and you're trying to decide for yourself and of course you can come in with your skepticism and everything which we talked about um but at the end of the day uh if you're not certain of something then you're aimless you're just floating around so agnosticism uh, like atheism for sure least nihilism for sure because they they say there's nothing else it's just this life but agnosticism there's potential there so i prefer agnosticism over the atheism it's not much better though that's all i'm saying But yeah, good question. Okay, and this actually leads me to what we're going to finish off with today, which is what you guys were talking about, which is the purpose of life. Because what is the purpose of life? That question, I believe it is the most powerful question that you can ask. It's so powerful that it's actually funny. Like, you know, Miss Sebeck sometimes, she's like, okay, do you guys have any questions, comments, the meaning of life? Like, the reason why she says that as a joke and the reason why we find it funny is because it's such a serious and deep question that we have no choice but to just laugh. But on Wednesday, we're actually going to be realistically looking at it and seeing, okay, what is the purpose of life? And when we discuss this, I don't mean what is your purpose of life, right? What's the difference between the two questions? What is the purpose and what is your purpose? What's the difference between those two? Yeah. Though it's like universal, but you is just individual, what you want. Or yeah, so yeah. when I say, yeah. Um, so the purpose of life is objective, but um, your purpose of life could be subjective because different people could have different meanings. Exactly. So both of you guys are right. When you ask what is the purpose of life, we're going to, on Wednesday, we're going to be going about it in a very objective manner. We're going to be looking at the possible solutions and saying, okay, does this one make sense? Not really, doesn't. This one sounds good. Does it, does that potential? Not really. So we're going to be going kind of like in a process of elimination and eventually arriving at something which actually makes sense. What is your purpose is something which is subjective, and it's not really, I mean, we'll talk about it on Wednesday. It's not really something which is substantiated. Everyone here sleeps on a bed, right? You guys go home, or you sleep in your house somewhere. I want you to imagine you go to sleep, and let's say you wake up on a train. So you wake up, you're on a train, you you look around, and you see people who are around you and they're having fun. They're watching movies, they're eating food, they're swimming in a swimming pool. Let's say it's like a huge train. So it, let's say you were in this situation and you woke up, you saw this, you saw this stuff. What would you get, like, 
what questions would you ask the people around you, like immediately? Uh, am I still sleeping? Okay, maybe. Am I still sleeping? Okay. Pinch me. But if you woke why up on a train. You, why are you here? How did I get here? How did I get here? Okay. What year is it? Okay, so yeah, what year is it? Um, maybe, you know, how did I get here? Who put me here? Where is the train going? These types of questions. I want you to imagine someone who is in that situation. And let's say they don't ask any of those questions. They just go and start playing and start swimming and start eating. Would you call that person a little bit like not intelligent? Like they were just thrust into a situation and they just went along with it. Right? Like that person is not actually asking the real questions. They're not thinking what just happened. They're not thinking. They're just going with what everyone else is doing. So you would say that person is, you know, the thing is, will that person ever be happy? Maybe, maybe at first, but eventually that person is going to start wondering, you know, like, why am I here? How do I get out? Where's the train going? Am I ever going to leave? I know I'm going to leave. Where am I going to be when I leave? Like, these are questions that that person is going to ask. So our life is like a train. There are things in life that feel good. There are things in life that feel bad. But at the end of the day, we have the formula, right? Suffering plus death. Those two things combined, that pushes us to look for meaning. That pushes us to look for a purpose. Because if there's no purpose, then what's the point of it all? So on Wednesday, we're going to be looking at the purpose of life, the different solutions. Because nihilism, we need to get away from nihilism using any means necessary. So we're going to be looking at how can we get away from it? Is there something which will kind of provide us a solution to that? So I'll see you guys here on Wednesday. Thank you guys for coming. Uh, just have a good rest of your day. And take some snacks.